You're watching Silver Screen and we're finally here at the 68th Annual Cannes Film Festival. We are going to have a fabulous time, so get ready for a fantastic ride. The Silver Screen 2015 Cannes Special was made possible by the National Film and Video Foundation. All photographs on the French Riviera were taken with a Huawei Mate 7. This is where the blood and marrow of the cam film market is. This is where the real deals are made. You'll find filmmakers here putting their best work forward. We're talking every genre from drama to romance to cult, fiction. This is where we'll be able to see what filmmakers have to offer. But unfortunately, not all of them will make it onto the shores of South Africa. So let's go in and see what's on offer. Uh, my name is Scott Martin with Archstone Distribution. I'm one of the partners here, and we have um, we have this one, "Don't Kill It." We're bringing to to Canada's doing some pre-sales on it. It's with Dolph Lundgren. The quality of the film is more important now than it ever was, because the, as we know, the the market is changing. The market is getting difficult, and uh, for now, uh, everything's cyclical. It's getting difficult right now. The digital revolution has has helped the industry. In some ways, in some ways it's hurt when you talk about piracy. For, for independent films, it is all across the board. You can go to a territory and sell it for $5,000 for a film. You can sell it for half a million dollars for a film. It all depends on the content. There, people are still going to watch films. It's how they watch it is what changes. The importance of having a name actor, um, like a Dolph Lundgren, on a film is that there are so many films out there. You have a few ways to rise above those films. Quality obviously is very important, but we all know that. So what are the couple of ways to rise above it? Name of an actor, that's one way, one way to rise above it. The other way would be uh, a quality film festival. That can help, that can get up there, because then people say, okay, well it is a good film, right? It doesn't necessarily need all the big names in it because it is a good quality film. People want to come see it. So there's so much out there. Uh, I always say, I, I, I firmly believe a good movie will, be, will get found. Well, right here at CNBC Africa, we are the money channel, and yes, it is about money. And the film industry is no different to any other industry. If you see a headline like this or a sign that posts a 35% tax rebate, it is sure to catch filmmakers' attention. Uh, being a distributor, what does that mean? You come here, you look at films, you get them, you finance them. How do you get them across? How you? Tell us how this works. Well, for us nowadays, it's the digital platform is is the key to the marketplace. So we can touch everybody um, online, you know, VOD. So day and date releases where we come out theatrically, but also come out video on demand. It's so big for us, like the iTunes, you know, the iTunes, the Netflix, the Voodoo's, Amazons, I mean, that's, it's changing the whole entire film industry. So this is just a bit of international flavor. As you know, we, there is a huge representation from all over the world. Just behind me, there is a stand from Chile. Uh, if I keep walking on this Southeast Asia, really there's everything uh, from every uh, part of the globe. So you can only imagine how difficult it must be being a filmmaker or even being an investor to find the right film and contend with everybody here. Uh, we just completed production on a film called War Pigs with Mickey Rourke and Dolph Lundgren. It's a World War II film we spent uh, the last year putting together. We're really excited about it. Um, we're here premiering the film and then I, it uh, premieres at the GI Film Festival in Washington, D.C. I'm putting together a group of hand-picked men for a, a very special mission and I need you to lead them. I need you back in the fight. So definitely a good response from the buyers. Very good response. Uh, partially because it's very heavily cast driven. We got Mickey Rourke, Dolph Lundgren, Chuck Liddell, who's a, a big UFC fighter, and we also got uh, Luke Goss. How did you manage to get your budget right uh, in terms of funding? These are big names that you're talking about. So from a cost perspective, getting this done must have set you back quite a bit. Actually, it was very tough because we had a, a under $2 million budget. Here, two fight clowns. Come 
had a man died following me. Following my own. Men died because of the orders, but more men did because of the orders. You're the right man for the job. And not everybody deserves a second chance. With that in mind, we had to do a lot of, of uh, negotiating. So it took us about six months to put the cast together, but uh, we pulled off a great film for a moderate budget. Did you work in collaboration with any funding institutions or how did you go about funding this particular project? We pre-sold most of the rights, so that's kind of what we do when we come to markets and we're trying to produce films. Part of our strategy is to pre-sell rights. So uh, once we pre-sell the rights to those territories, we can uh, finance the paper for the contracts before we go into production. I gotta get close. Jack. Let's make it count. We are at the short film corner and here from a pool of around 3,000 entries in the short film category, only a select few have been chosen to compete and of course from here there will be an overall winner. Now these select few, their films can be viewed in the booth behind me. I can tell you although it's very, very heavy competition, it's nonetheless very exciting. The independent film market has been under pressure of late. Are you finding that uh, buyers are wanting something different? Just give us some context as to what's driving sales at the moment. I think the, the biggest change over um, in the business is that it's become very much, it's very niche driven, if you like. If you think about how TV is now, you have very specific channels. You know, we know that Lifetime wants female driven thrillers. A sci-fi channel wants sci-fi. So that it's just, the business has sort of grown up a lot and, you know, consumers want the things they want. Is it still very important to have a star uh, in your films? I is that still, you know, the pulling factor? It's funny, I'm, once I got quoted for saying that when a buyer comes in our office, they say, what's new? Who's in it? Okay, tell us what it's about. <laughs> if, let's say you're selling to a TV station, it's much easier if there's a familiar face on screen versus somebody who's, you know, new or up and coming. So the idea is really to find a mix of new talent surrounded by names that are already recognized. International films are well represented here, as you can see from the wall behind me. Uh, all coming from different genres. I can tell you, this one grabs my attention. It might be one that I'm keen to watch. The Far East is also very well represented with a massive contingent from that particular part of the world. Well, thanks for your time. So you've been coming to Cannes since 1983. How's business been? Uh, how's it different this year from the past couple of decades? Uh, the last 32 years. <laughs> uh, it's gone up, it's gone down. Uh, the markets come. Theatrical was strong. That video it was strong. That DVD. Uh, that pay TV came in. So there's always you know, new markets and new challenges. You mentioned a couple of changes in the environment over the years. What's been the biggest challenge for you? And how have you aligned yourself so that you're in a position where you can still make money? I would say for our company was the uh, what they call the crash of the video DVD marketplace. Uh, it's gone down, but it hasn't gone away. And it's been replaced a lot by television. We've worked with some pretty amazing stars. Uh, you know, over the years, we did Quentin Tarantino's you know, first film back in 1991. We worked with Sharon Stone. Uh, we worked with um, Vanessa Redgrave, uh, Ray Liotta. You know, there's been a, you know, probably, we've done about 180 films, so we with a lot of actors. Wake up and apologize. Is much more colorful. Hear your name. Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Orange, Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? I pick. Be thankful you're not Mr. Yellow. I'm acting like a professional. They get you, they get closer to me, and that can't happen. Reservoir Dogs. This year, the biggest one has been Sky Sharks, which is a little over the top, but uh, we're pre-selling it. And uh, the market's been very, very strong. What's happening, Father? 
There's something on the radar. Must be in the metrics for trying to get rounds up to us. Papa, I have a high gesehen zwischen den Wolken. It's a high concept, if it's a creature feature or something like that, the creature's the star, so you don't necessarily need names. Um, if it's going to be something more of a thriller, then you do need a name because the titles have to have hooks for the buyers to, to, to market them. So if you have the big monster or that kind of stuff, something really out there, it makes it easier for them to sell, so they'll simply choose your product first. We're here at the full market and as you know it does cover everything from full makers to distributors. But another important element is special and visual effects. Now this particular company did the special and visual effects for one of the films that is in competition and that is called Tale of Tales by Matteo Garoni. I can tell you just look ar looking around here this is absolutely fascinating. There are many independent film producers who you'll probably never see the light of day. I've never heard of this film, Blood Window, and I probably never will, may never hit South Africa's shores. So what is the strategy here? A lot of independent film producers put up these massive posters here and uh, this definitely will catch your attention. How do you uh, suss out who the real guys are from the ones that are just sort of trying their luck or just poses? <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, you don't know until you start talking to them because they could pretend they have something great and amazing. But it's really a series of questions because what we're looking for is what is the project? Is there financing attached? And what have you done before? If there's no cast, keep it under a million. Um, it is better to have cast that's internationally recognizable and increase your budget because you're going to get a return in the long run. This again just gives you the magnitude of the Cannes Film Festival. Behind me right here are daily trades, different magazines and uh, of course you'll remember some of them. These are just familiar names like the Hollywood Reporter. And just paging through this, look at the size of this thing every single day. How's business been? Business is um has been soft, I would say. Um, the reason for it is that there's a lot of places around the world right now uh, where the dollar is strong against, against uh, comparative currencies in those countries. Uh, plus, there has been the great disruptor, Netflix. So how are you responding to all these uh, disruptive trends? Well, I've been doing this a long time. So the market, it's like a stock market. It goes up, it goes down. What you have to do is adapt. Can filmmakers still make money in this industry? You said it's been soft and it's like the stock market, it's got ebbs and flows, but can, you know, right now, is this a good time for a filmmaker to say, I'm going to go in right now and I'm going to make a movie? What advice would you have for them? Well, I think it's a terrific time to make a movie. First off, this is the most self-renewing business in the entire world. Um, all you have to do is look out there in the harbor at all those yachts. There's always somebody who's made a lot of money doing something else who wants to be in the film business. What advice would I give a low-budget filmmaker to, to attract stars? Um, you got to have money up front. You have to have holding money for them. If you look at their, their management teams, stars management teams, agents, managers, lawyers, they just, they want money. You don't play the director. You don't hover over them. You let them change your lines. You let them make up their own contributions and do things. Because the people that I've worked with have had careers and are famous and are great before they met me. And they're great in my movies and they're great after they leave me. So nothing special is happening. If you just hire wonderful people, that's all you have to do, and just don't mess them up. Don't ruin them. And, you know, it's really a very simple thing.
watching the 68th annual Cannes Film Festival and of course Silver Screen is bringing you all the action. Uh, I'm here with Sir Kinigal Theatres. We are a, uh, an acquirer of independent film, which is what Cannes celebrates. So we're on the lookout for those really beautiful art house films which we can buy specifically and often exclusively for our Cinema Nouveau circuit. But we're also here to meet with major distributors and major you know, film producers around upcoming projects which are two, three years in the pipeline in the making to get a view of what our business landscape will look like in the next two or three years. The landscape of how people communicate with each other, how they watch movies, yeah. how they watch videos, is changing. Uh, what are some of the key trends that you've seen and how are you adapting to them? I think it's very interesting. I was at a talk yesterday with Ted DeSantos from Netflix uh, talking about the, the, his proposed view of the world with content windows, so how soon a film moves to television or to online streaming after theatrical release. I think that's going to be an interesting space. I don't think anyone really has figured that out just yet. But I think one thing which is, you know, Stuart Kinnigal has long stood for and continues to stand for is that the cinema experience itself is what's really, really matters and counts. And so, you know, and Ted said it yesterday, he said, look, if we, are, are, if you're going on a first date as a 15-year-old boy, Netflix can't really support that as an environment like the cinema experience can. So whilst the uh, content window landscape is changing, and I think that's an exciting place uh, for filmmakers to be in, particularly the film viewing place as a cinema remains an ongoing challenge to keep it uh, experientially really impressive and wonderful. We've got three films that are screening here at the market. We've got Dia Santana, which is a uh, South African Angolan co-production that we just did. Uh, I'm the writer, producer, director on that, and I have a co-production partner from Angola. That's screening here. Uh, it's screening on Monday here at 9:45 uh, on on Monday. We have Bordering on Bad Behavior, which is a really cool dramedy that takes place in the Middle East that we shot. And then we've got uh, The Windmill, also known as Divin Pump, which is an Afrikaans language film. We're uh, marketing it here as an English language film. That screened yesterday and is screening again on Monday. There's three real reasons why people choose South Africa to shoot in. Uh, one is uh, it's very inexpensive because of the exchange rate between the rand and the dollar or the euro. Um, two is we have more diversity in terms of locations in close proximity to one another in Cape Town than any place that I've seen in the world. This is an fascinating industry. There's the lights, there's the glamour, but we need to make a living out of this. And this is where you come in. Yeah, well, I just I have a book coming out called Beyond the Craft, What You Need to Know to Make a Living Creatively. That's a proactive guide for actors, directors, writers, producers. And I do workshops around the world. So the biggest mistake I think actors, writers, and directors make is that they want to depend on somebody. They should, they should never depend on anyone. They should never rely on anyone. If somebody, like an agent or a manager or a producer, comes through for them, great. But they should try to learn how to make things happen for themselves. It's very interesting because you're both actresses, but you come from different parts of the world, South Africa and the UK. What are some of the differences and similarities of being an actress in this particular industry? Good grief, how much time do you have? <laughs> I think the thing with South Africa is it's still a growing industry. We're still trying to make our way into the international market. Um, there's a lot of lot happening in the South African industry. I think our actors are getting more opportunities, um, starting to create a star system and within our own country. We still have a way to go, but I think there's so much talent and, and I have a lot of hope as an actress. And then I'm a film producer as well, so it kind of gives me a different perspective on the, uh, the industry. You spoke about how you are changing things, uh, seeing that it's an established market, you've also taken things into your own hands. Yes, I, I think it's really important to do that. I, I think it's even more important as women to do that. Uh, I, I've been to a lot of panels since I've been here. I've been asking quite a lot of questions about, about the female voice, the female audience. And, and actually, uh, I, I think more and more it's important as, as a, a, an actress that, that perhaps we do need to produce and write our own, our own work because there seems to be a gap between um, the roles that there are for women and also an, an age gap. You have ingenue, you know, this is very, very young, and then you have the very, very old, and actually women exist 
uh, at all times in life, and yet they become invisible. So I think Absolutely. I think it's it's down to us really to, to make more work for ourselves. Uh, the, the film that that I've just done was essentially written when the director was writing it. He had me in his his head. That would be political suicide. There was a lady here when I checked in. She saw Sophie. She she touched her hand. I don't know. Where is the mother? Another unwanted. So sad. Lisa, every village off that road is a rabbit warren of streets, and many of them without even names. That kind of radius without an army of backup. I would forget it. They say the mother whose child is under the wheels of the bus will find the strain to leave the bus. Open the door. I won't ask again. I've been busy with films. I just completed my second feature film called Safe Bet, and um, it's currently in post-production. And I'm here at Cannes now to celebrate and also to push the film forward. But just your take on if somebody was looking to get into this industry, what your advice would be to them? Most of our films feel as if they are rushed. It feels like this person wrote the script and the minute they were finished, they believed that they have a masterpiece and decided to go into production. So I believe if we further look at that into developing script writers, we would probably be good. In terms of crew, I believe we've got everything in South Africa. Frank, you robbed the betting shop! No, no, no. no, no. We went there to steal some stuff, but we didn't take anything. Yeah, Nothing. No, no, we'll no. Have any... If they didn't take anything, it's not really robbing. That is it. You are? If they didn't take anything, then they didn't rob you. It wasn't a robbery. It's whatever I say it is, all right? Being a producer, you've had a couple of films out. What's the status quo on you at the moment? Um, well, we, we've come to Cannes this year because we have a film in the market at the moment. Um, we've sold most of the rights around the world, but there's a few territories in Europe that we're still selling. Um, it was a film we released last year in South Africa called Leading Lady. Um, my business partner, Hank Pretorius, um, co-produced, wrote and um, directed the film, um, which we're releasing in the US in June and we're releasing in the UK in September. at the moment he's in LA he's busy kicking down the casting directors doors because we've got a sci-fi thriller that we are busy working on um, which we're looking at producing early 2016 most producers spend most of their time and energy just getting the film made and and I completely understand the psychology behind that but unfortunately that's just not enough anymore you need to make sure that before you even go to production that you have a set out plan you have a set out marketing plan a sales plan and look into the the mystery of of rights and worldwide territories and how your product travels. I think a lot of people, especially in a small local market, they'll make a film just for that market, not thinking what could I have done in this film to make it travel you know, across territories. The biggest motivation for us is obviously we do this to tell stories, but it's also to, to get out into the world to understand the industry on a global scale. You know, as South African filmmakers, we had the privilege of releasing films in South Africa and understanding that market. But I think it's a bit beyond that now. It's understanding how to make movies for the world. You've been doing this for decades. I grew up in Hollywood. I've been working in Hollywood since right out of high school, working in animation, working it's just school of hard knocks, I call it. Um, working uh, for Aaron Spelling on Love Boat and uh, Heart to Heart and Dynasty, uh, moving over to Universal, moving over to Warner Brothers with Columbia Pictures and, and just making it through business affairs 10 years with Columbia TriStar Pictures. We have a lot of filmmakers, especially you know the American Billion people, that come here and they they want to come to Cannes. They want to experience the the best that what they the, the fantasy they might think Cannes is, but they don't understand that this is a market. This is the commerce of our industry. And if you don't understand that, I don't know what you're doing here. Filmmakers have to have an agenda when they come to a place like this, and uh, you know just like uh, in Hollywood, you need to know that the story that you have is commercially viable. The bottom line that, that everybody's making a mistake in, and now that we're, we're bean counting everything, we're trying to justify maximizing our bottom line, 
is that the one thing you cannot change is story is everything. Hollywood is dumbing down the stories to, for commercialism, for a McDonald's tie-in, whatever it is, and we're not doing a service to the public. It's corporate driven and they're, they're, they think that moving something from one corporate to another corporate to purchase or buy or live a lifestyle or reality television is what the public wants. And I believe the public wants is a smart story. Love.